so hopefully got it okay um thanks everybody uh thanks mark you reached out on email and i was like and you're asking for people to speak and i haven't spoken meetups before but i've been wanting to it sounds fun to you know i feel like the best way to learn is to teach and so um we're, we're growing a lot right now where we're at and it's been a lot of fun we've been able to work on a lot of different projects and so one of the fun things i think we've been working on is event driven design and so i figured it'd be a fun topic to talk about um a little bit about myself um just to kind of uh, i'm dano uh just uh, i have two kids i have a two-year-old and a four-month-old um i like the utah jazz a lot I also like books. So Brandon Sanderson books. I don't know if anybody, is there any Brandon Sanderson fans here? Oh, man, super good. Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings, also a lot more deeper. If anybody likes talking about fiction books, I enjoy them. Or like programming books, also like those. Uh, and I work for Fashion Files and Engineering Manager. Um, when I started with Fashion File, we were five engineers. We're now 41. And so I've worked there for four, four years and it's been, it's been fun to see us grow and changed and so our tech stack has changed a lot and i'll talk a little bit about that which has kind of spurred our movement towards this event driven architecture uh, i've been programming for about eight years i started with php did a lot of laravel symphony zen falcon i worked for like a, a tech firm or a dev firm up in salt lake and we were able to do a lot of different stuff now we do a lot of node and view and react and then i like to play around in scala I think it's fun doing some functional languages. So just a little bit about myself. And I started out by creating a music website called Bacon and Music. That was my first website I ever built as a blog where I reviewed people's music. It was fun. And until I deleted the whole database. And that's how, that's when I stopped Bacon and Music. So, all right. Um, and those are my two kids. So I've got two little, two little ones. They're fun. All right. So I figured a little participation if you guys want. If not, I can always just sit up here and talk for a while. It's up to you. Um, but we're talking about event driven uh, design and event driven architecture. So I figured we could start out with what is an event? Thing that happens. Yeah, yeah, basically, right? I think it's pretty, pretty simple. Uh, it's an event that uh, occurs, event, an event occurs when an object sends a signal that an action has taken place. So uh, basically, something happens, right? Um, I like to break it down uh, personally, like obviously there's a bunch of ways of kind of defining events, but in my mind with programming, I like to break down events as an, op an object has an action. And I think it's an easy way to kind of conceptualize events sometimes. So a couple of examples might be a user registers for your site. That is an event or an order is created or a newsletter gets signed up for or a com comment is submitted, right? So there's a ton of different events and there's a lot of different ways to kind of use these, um, but they're to help us kind of like uh, conceptualize some of these ideas. Cause I think a lot of times for those who've worked in any type of procedural code, you can become spaghetti. And so sometimes when you define things together as events, it can become pretty easy to kind of uh, encapsulate stuff. Oftentimes when people talk about events, we talk about listeners too. Does anybody know what a listener is? A chance. If not, I'll keep on going. I just thought I'd something that listens to events, right? It's a handler that acts off an event being triggered, right? 10 points to Gryffindor. Um, so an example of this might be the jazz win. All right. That is an event. Let's say the jazz win the, the playoffs or the whole the whole finals, right? There I am. I'm stoked about it. Dom Mitchell, my boy, Spida's there with me. We're celebrating. Actually, wouldn't be there because he'd be winning the game. And then you got LeBron here, pissed that he's on the couch watching it, right? So the event is the playoffs, right? The NBA Finals and them winning it, right? The listener in this case is myself. I'm the listener to this action, right? And what listeners do is listeners can encapsulate a couple actions that can happen. So if I'm listening to the Utah Jazz winning, what happens next? Well, I'm probably going out, smashing a couple pans out in the street, celebrating, giving my wife a hug, you know, we're all high-fiving. There's a lot of actions that can happen after an event, right? So the event is what's causing all of these subsequent events to happen. And are they happening asynchronous or synchronous? I don't know, right? I might be doing all of it at once, or I might be happening synchronously. 
Um, and so don't mind the watermarks or anything like that. You know, I threw this together. This is this is as creative as I get. So um, took me like way longer than it should have too, but I did it. So uh, so why use events, right? Um, I think I kind of already touched on this a little bit of why we use events. But in our case, this is an example of, we use Datadog for a lot of our metrics. And this is us a year and a half ago, all right? So I don't know how many of you, I've worked with uh, Datadog or just any type of analytics, I imagine so. So this is CPU utilization on our writer and reader, right? So we have one writer, we have several readers that are uh, replicants. And what do you guys notice here? So the graph on the left is the percentage of usage of utilization, bottom is the time. We're nailing hundred percent. We're just like, and this is within half an hour of each other, right? Like almost on the hour, we're boom, hitting it, boom, hitting it. And so what happens when you hit hundred percent, things start failing, right? And so this was a problem and it had to be solved because oftentimes we would hit here and you know, that big one, very possibly our site went down for a second of just like nothing can even can even write to the database because there's no more threads open right and so um obviously that's a problem um so a couple things that we ran into is this caused latency uh customer experience was bad because now pages that should have taken milliseconds to load are taking 30 seconds long maybe even timing out because they can't ever get a connection established um we weren't able to share data as we wanted to. So one of the other reasons, so these are kind of talking some of the use cases of why we started using events more is we started spreading out, uh, our monolith was taking up too much activity, you know, like we didn't have the, we couldn't scale up anymore is what our problem was. We need to start scaling out. So we had to start pulling out some of our services into jobs, into other uh, applications and sharing data between them became really tough. Uh, and they weren't reusable and they were re readable. And with events, we were able to use some readability. Uh, they're easier to understand and they're easier to reuse. So I want to talk about an experience that I had that hopefully helps anecdotally talk about events. There's this bus. I lived in Virginia for a while and uh, there's this bus called the Chinatown bus. And so me and my friend decided we want to go to New York and it's like a seven hour drive to get to New York. And so a couple of things about this bus is it goes from Chesapeake, Virginia up to Little China, New York. Um, it left daily at 10 p.m. and arrived in New York at 5 a.m. and then turned around at 2 p.m. and came back to Chesapeake, right? So you have this bus that's coming back and forth. It was nice because it was only $20. It was like nothing to ride the, the bus. Like imagine paying $20 for a seven hour trip, 14 hours total going to New York and back. So also great for people who are working in the city but don't want to live in the city so they could work in New York, take this bus from Virginia there and coming back. And for us, we were like, hey, we'll take it and we'll all sleep on the bus, usually. Um, but the bus aren't the best buses. And so uh, I get on the bus, mind you, it's 10 o'clock at night and about 11, it starts raining. And the bus's hole did not want to hold. And the position that I was at ended up just dripping on me for six hours. So I'm sitting in a bus for six hours getting dripped on. There's me. I have a t-shirt on me. I eventually made it stop in the middle and I got a poncho because they wouldn't let me switch my seat because we were too full. And I, uh, I got dripped on for seven hours and I, was, and I left, the, left it soaking. So not fun. But I bring up the bus because oftentimes people refer to events and in queuing systems as event buses because the analogy kind of works pretty well. Um, so if I take the example of the Chinatown bus and some of the things about the Chinatown bus that might, you might run into when taking a bus of any sort, but I'm using this one as the example, is you might run into that you're going to have to go to a bus terminal, right? You might have to also go to, you're going to find a bus, you're going to need a route that you're going to take, you're going to need passengers, which is myself, and the passengers are going to need a ticket, right? When Dealing with buses, those are common things that you're going to need to in order to use a bus. So let's talk about event buses then. And once again, this is all pivotal in order to learn how to use event-driven design is you need an event service. 
And I'll talk about these a little bit more. So I'm just going to go through these and we'll kind of break them down a little bit as we go into it a little, a little bit more. Uh, and an event service is kind of like a bus terminal and we'll kind of talk about that, but you'll need a queue, uh, topics or channels. You'll need a message that's going to be sent and then you'll need some authentication. So we'll talk about these a little bit. And I do like to kind of put a warning before is that like all technologies, they're all super different. And so I'm going to talk generally about how queues work, but you might go to a different queue and they might use different names and they might use different ways of connecting to them. Um, and so this is just a general kind of talking about it. if anybody has questions after we can go into more depth or I can help you with it and we can walk through it. It's fun. It's fun conversation, but this is a general kind of overview of some of the things that you'll need to set up the event driven design and then uh, how, how it solves some of our problems. So as far as for first, we'll talk about an event service. So there's several different event services. There's RabbitMQ, there's Amazon SNS, there's Kafka. Has anybody used any of these before? You said Kafka. All of them. Nice. Anybody have any other ones that I forgot? I know there's other things out there, but these are the three that I mainly hear about. I don't know if there's any other ones. Oh, Google Pubs. I was thinking about GCP. And then there's Azure has one too, but I don't use Azure a ton. So um, but these are all eventing services. I've used all of these and they're all really good. They're all very different um, in how they work, but I'm not going to get into each of their differences exactly unless people have any questions about it. But um, we right now use SNS and Kafka. Um, SNS because it's cheap and Kafka because it's pretty powerful, but it's complex like we were talking about earlier. So as far as for the bus, uh, I consider that part the queue, right? The actual queue that we'll be working with. And so with queues, a couple of things, you know, a quick definition about it, a queue is a queue is a linear structure which follows a particular order in which operations are performed. The order is first in, first out. And it's not always that way, but we're going to go with the first in, first out because that's the most common way. If you think about going to Disneyland, right, people think you go to Disneyland ride rides, really you go to Disneyland to wait in lines, right? And the way you actually do Disneyland is first one goes in the queue. You wait in a line. Once you're to the front, you go into the into the uh, you ride the ride. So, what are the benefits of using a queued system? Um, for all those who use Laravel, do you use? Does anybody here use events within Laravel? I don't use use events. Do you uh, do you queue up your events like in a in like a or do you run them like synchronously? Do you know? Uh, no, we queue. Cool. Yeah. What's the, what do you feel like the benefits are of, of doing something like that? Well, it doesn't take, it doesn't stop your, uh, it, it allows your, uh, the process that is doing the queuing to continue on without waiting for that stuff to happen. Yeah. So it makes it pseudo asynchronous. Yeah. So I like bringing this up with the PHP group because everybody is on Reddit. Well, I don't know if everybody's on Reddit, but those who are on Reddit, have seen the garbage people talk about with PHP, right? And people like to hate on PHP, it's an easy punching bag. I like PHP a lot. I think we all, we're, we're here because we all like PHP. But uh, PHP, a big, uh, some people have problems with because it's synchronous, right? Like it runs synchronously. Uh, it's also old things with you know, PHP 5 they might have issues with, but the biggest one I would agree is it runs in parallel with your application. So it runs asynchronously and so, I mentioned earlier, one of the problems we were running with fashion file is that the latency with people are having, right? And so our issue was, let's say I was hitting our email service provider to send an email and I hit it and let's say our email service provider is down. And this is actually a real scenario. We actually had this happen often. We were with Mandrill and they were not the best email service provider. Uh, it's MailChimp. And uh, what happened was we'd hit them, they'd be down, we'd wait 30 seconds. And during that 30 seconds, the customer's just waiting because it's just hitting and it's just waiting because we have to wait for the response before we can continue. So we got smart and we're like, obviously you go into a queue and you throw that in because who cares about, why do you have to wait for an email to be sent anytime in the next five or 10 minutes, except for maybe some occasions. But you just throw that into a queue, it sends off eventually on some other time and the customer you know, doesn't know any different, right? Um, in most cases, they're replayable. There's one thing that versus some of the different ones, SQS, not replayable, Kafka is replayable, but it's something super beneficial, right? I always think of like, I always talk about replayability as kind of like a VHS tape. You know, you guys remember like VHS tapes and how like, they're just a series of images. 
right? Um, we'll talk a little bit more about, about that actually in a little bit. Uh, they can be consumed by multiple sources. So you could have a queue that has multiple listeners and they're easily scalable because they're on something else. So you can have them uh, in some other server running and you can easily scale that server to have however big you want, or you could run them serverless, right? So here's just a little graphic to show how that works. You know, as far as a queue, it gets inserted in and the first one gets removed out and they just run in order. Um, I think everybody kind of knows how a queue works. As far as for the event bus, uh, I'm just gonna talk about these last three. I don't really wanna go into too much depth about them, but topics and channels are basically the route that you're deciding. Um, if you're doing any type of subscription model, you'll know to need to know the name basically of where you're trying to subscribe to. So it might be, if it's, if we were to take the example of like a user registered, you might have a user topic that you subscribe to that gives you all of the data about the user. The message would just be the notification that's coming through. Usually it's going to be most things we work on is just JSON. And then the authentication is really up to you of how you want to authenticate. Um, and we'll kind of talk a little about that as we do some of the code presentations. Does anybody have any questions up till this point about event in the event bus? We'll kind of go into some other, we'll kind of go more into event driven architecture, but before we kind of move on from events and queues, any questions? All right, what is event-driven architecture? So we've talked about events, we've talked about queues. What is event-driven architecture? Does anybody here use an event-driven architecture within their company? Yeah, I imagine Adobe would. Like, they're just huge, I would, I would suspect so. Um, we didn't a year and a half ago when we were showing you this problem. And that's been one of the fun things, that's why I wanted to talk about this is because it's something we're in the middle of doing. We've actually had a lot of our things get moved over, but an event-driven architecture is, uh, and we'll, we'll talk about, this is AWS documentation I found, and it's, it's a pretty good explanation. An event-driven architecture uses events to trigger and communicate between decoupled services and is common in modern applications, but with microservices. An event is a change in state or an update, like an item being placed in a shopping cart on an e-commerce website. Events can either carry the state, the item purchased, its price, and the delivery address, or events can be identifiers, a notification that an order was shipped. So the event-driven architecture at its core is really just uh, very decoupled actions, right? That you're just taking, you're separating from everything else and you're hoping that this piece of state you can present to whoever, whoever needs it and you actually don't care. You know, I feel like that's one of the best parts about this is that you're, whether you're producing or you're consuming the event, so whether you're the creator of the, you're creating the event and, and triggering it or consuming it, you don't really care where it's going or where it's coming from. You just care about what's there and it allows kind of some seamless integrations. And I've got some other things to show with that. So um, one of the biggest benefits of event-driven architecture is event sourcing. So I don't know who know, here knows Martin Fowler. He has some really awesome books. I recommend them. Um, and he has a really good website with just a ton of awesome articles. So he's kind of like one of the gurus of, of event-driven architecture. And so one of the main concepts of event-driven architecture is event sourcing. And event sourcing is the core idea of event sourcing is that whenever we make a change to the state of a system, we record the state change as an event. And we can confidently rebuild the system state by reproducing the events at any time in the future. So if I go back to my VHS analogy, right? Each piece of tape that is an image is basically a piece of state, right? And so your state would be, let's say the user registered, the person signs up and the first state of the user registered is just my first name and last name, right? And so that's the first event that comes through. The next event might be they set a password, right? And so that's the second state. And the third state might be they then add an address. So we have three different states. And event sourcing, if you think of it like a VHS tape, if I wanted to go back, I could, with a, with a VHS, I can just rewind back to whatever image or whatever piece of tape if I want and replay it, I could redo it, replay it, and I could just watch that same scene over and over again. Likewise, event sourcing is similar, where you could take, let's say you push all these events. So those three events go into the queue and let's say my website crashes, right? Let's say I'm having those latency issues and I'm crashing. And so database calls are missing and I'm just not getting all that I want in here. 
what you can do is if my database had crashed, I could rewind my events and I could replay them and feed back into my database and not lose any data. So if you're ever having problems, and that's why I say like if you're having problems with data consistency or losing data from database calls like we were, that was a huge solution for us is that we can now start feeding our databases and be able to replay that. So kind of example of talking about publishers and consumers or producers and consumers, there's different names of calling them, publisher and subscriber. Um, this is from Kafka's documentation. What happens is with these events is that you have publishers on the left and the publishers are the ones who are producing the data, right? So in the middle, the publish subscribe system, uh, and it, it would essentially be an event system. So you might be creating an event with a queue. And what will happen is a publisher would say, hey, a user's happened. A uh, user, your user was just registered and they'll push it to the, your publish subscribe system or your event, uh, your event service. So if you're in Kafka, your Kafka would be your publish subscribe system. On the other side of it, you'll have listeners who are listening or subscribed to your publish subscribe system or Kafka and they'll do whatever they want with it. Once again, the people on the left don't care about the people on the right. And so they're able to kind of decouple work together. So here's a, an example of, and it's kind of cut off on the top, but of kind of a more, and this one uses Apache Kafka. Once, I, once again, I got this one from Kafka, but you could work with a bunch of different systems. You could have a web app, you could have a, a iPhone app, you could have monitoring, you could have analytics that are consuming this data and you can have whatever source you want from the bottom, right? Or from wherever else, these are just examples. You can have from a SQL database, you can have from wherever, and they can be feeding and producing from each other and they don't care about the others. So this is where for our architecture, we're microservicing out our architecture right now. So we currently have, we've had for the past seven years, a Laravel monolith. And in the beginning, it was great. There's five of us, we're working on the monolith, Laravel, I really enjoy Laravel. Problem is now we're up to 41 engineers. And how do you do 41 engineers on one repo, right? And our scope of our project has just grown so much that one, we need faster services. We also don't want to use Laravel for everything. We want to use serverless technologies. We've been using a lot of Lambda functions. It's pretty hard. Um, and so what we've done is we've separated out into five different uh, macro services, what we're calling them, because microservices also have its own problem. But, and what happens is all of those services feed up into a truth, a source of truth, which then feed, can feed everybody else. And nobody cares where anybody's at. And it kind of makes working together a lot easier where they don't have to be calling each other or maintaining one database or something like that. So it makes it a lot easier for them to work. Uh, if, you have, if you have questions right now, definitely go for it. Uh, how do you manage uh, chains yeah, that's a great question. So we do run all of our uh, infrastructure and even our events through like uh, Terraform. And so we try and put everything into code. But once again, I'm going to say we haven't actually ran into that issue a ton um, because we, once again, we've only been doing this for about a year and a half. And so We've added to it plenty of times, but adding to it's very easy. Um, I haven't said we ever ran into it because we haven't been doing it long enough, but it's a really great question that I would be, I will give you an answer to once we start running into it more, you know? Yeah, we'll talk, we'll talk. Cause I imagine that will come up and that would be, we'll kind of get to that, but that's one of the cons of this is it can become very complex. And so you do have to be able to manage kind of deprecating services, right? Uh, but I would, I would assume we would do it similar to example, an API where we probably version it out, um, just like how you would with an API, if you're going to version, you know, your API and you're going to deprecate some fields within your API, you probably come out with a version two or something like that, that would, you would have to make people kind of move to later. Yeah, on the same topic, uh, you talked about replay, have you done any replaying in a serious way? That not in a serious way, not like something where we had a big issue because luckily with doing this, we've actually solved a lot of our problems and with microservings like kind of pulling our stuff out like our different services we haven't ran into as much like our latency issues we haven't ran into as much and so we haven't in a serious way but we have done it in just kind of a testing way 
and it was it was cool like it was pretty easy to use but we haven't had to like get into a crisis situation yet and then what, what kind of retention policy you're setting up to this? yeah so we only do about we do a month of retention um which is still probably really long we'll probably change it at some point just because we haven't ran into it it's kind of like our cloud watch logs we have a hard time figuring out how long because we'll like put it as like three months and we'll be like we're wasting a ton of money and then we'll put it out like three weeks and then we'll need something from a month ago and then we'll be like okay and so we're constant changing trying to figure out the target amount and yeah so in the case that you want to rebuild from the event you want to be able to have months worth of events so that you can store some backup and so yeah kind of past and then start replaying from that um exactly because we do keep snapshots of everything and i actually believe we do it much more frequently than that um just because we use aws for everything we also use their infrastructure so we do keep i believe snapshots like every day at least and i want to say it's more so i would think that we'd be able to but just in case we do go longer because it's also just not super expensive and so yeah no those are fantastic questions but i'll let you know i i appreciate it because I'm not hoping for the day that we have to use it. I think it's one of those things that we have because one of our problems was, is we had a huge single point of failure. Like that's what our biggest problem was, is like our database went down, which once again, we had one database and we had one monolith. And so one goes down, everything goes down. Like we have lots of Kafka. So we have different shards of Kafka, like in different containers. And so um, it is spread out. It is, once again, Kafka is a beast. And luckily I don't manage that. We do have a DevOps team that manages it, but um, we have like with everything, and, and we also use managed Kafka. And so that does solve some of our problems too. So we'll see how in the long term that plays out and I'll keep you updated. Maybe we'll do like a status update in a year of what's happened with our services, but um, definitely we'll, we'll find out. So great. Is there any other questions by chance? Yeah. I'm sorry, I can't hear you super well, oh, Seth. So, like, what what dictates the subscriber that says just No, I'm I'm pretty sure Kafka does that. I'd have I'll have to research. Let me let me make sure. Yeah, because I. Oh, they were wondering, he is wondering who uh, who manages the pointer in the Kafka queue. Is that right? And who defines it? Oh, no, I think, so when we did it, I only had one thing subscribed to it at the time, because once again, it was just in a test. And so I was able to just replay that one. I, I, that's a great question of how it replays across multiple. I'm not positive. You, I'll have to find that out. You would, you yeah. Would, you just do it on a subscriber by, by subscriber basis. So yeah. if, if a subscriber gets out of sync, you just replay that subscriber. Yeah. Now you may end up having, you may end up replaying multiple subscribers and yeah. you may have a script that, that allows you to do that all at one, in one shot. Yeah. But it is a subscriber by subscriber cool. basis. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah. I only had one. So I didn't actually think about that, but that's a great question. Do you have another question over here? Okay. Anything else? These are fantastic questions. I like learning my, that's, this is the goal. Cool. All right. Uh, our theme right now and why we're doing this, and this is our theme across engineering is highly aligned, loosely coupled. We want to be on the same page. Cause right now, one of our things that we've done is we also have broken out into five different engineering teams. And so each team owns a part of our domain. And I know a lot of teams, a lot of companies do this. We're just copying everybody else, basically. It's the Spotify tri tribe stuff. And so we're just trying to stay highly aligned, loosely coupled, where we can work together, but we don't have to be in each other's business. And so that was our big, one of our big reasons why outside of the needs of like latency issues, we also wanted to just stay uh, in touch with each other and being able to update each other's uh, based on actions and events. Another question, how do you stay um, highly aligned Yeah, it's a great question. So there's two different ways that we do that. We do chapters where we do chapter services and chapters of a front end chapter. And what that is, it's all front end engineers meet once a week for an hour and all back end engineers meet every week for an hour. We also will do cross functional teams. So like, for example, 
we're working on the my account section and one of our teams is our seller team and one of our teams is our customer team because we do both intake and we sell um, luxury purses and so our seller team and our customer team are going to have to both work on the account pages because an account has to do both right and so for that, we do all of our inception, we do all of our you know, sprints, we do that together and we work together in that. But once again, different API sets and they're able to kind of feed and, and talk to each other that way. That's a bigger struggle. That's a hard one, you know, but we definitely try our best to figure out which one's gonna take the longest amount. So that's a big one is we actually have three huge projects going on right now of, that are going to be start starting to use this application. And so what we're doing is the first one will go up and we're also very iterative in our approach of like, we're not trying to like, wait, we're not trying to waterfall this down and just deploy everything at once. And so with these three projects that we're working on that we'll start using this, we're deploying one without the other two in a non-production environment, or at least not having anybody use it yet, but in a way that it can start getting fed data and we can kind of prove our concept. And then as the other ones get released, that way we can prove it in production. And when the next one comes out, we'll be good in the next one. And by October, all three should be out. And that's when hopefully we've proven our concept uh, with these three and we can deploy everything and come up in production. So it's hard. It's a, it's a hard balancing act of it, but it is just working iteratively to figure out where everybody's at. I, I think the hardest thing, it's just like APIs, right? Like if you think about even front and back end, the, the conversation of like making sure the front end has the back end APIs by the time they're working on their front end and like being able to work sometimes, there's even problems there. So it's all just keeping aligned and knowing each other's timelines and keeping like we do milestones and like Gantt charts of like where everybody's at. So we're, we're learning though, you know, so it's, it's always a, a process. And once again, we're also growing a lot. So a lot of uh new things we're trying to figure out and we're just reading what other people do so if you have any suggestions open to it so have you ran anything better i don't know if you yeah yeah straight offs and a lot of it's just boils down to communication and transparency like i think transparency is a huge part of it of just like hey i'm going to take an extra month than i thought it was going to take you know and that's the biggest part is like if one person's working on something there's a dependency there and you're expecting it and it doesn't happen. So it's just, it's just open communication. And I feel like that's something that I, I do feel like our culture really trying to tries to promote as much as possible. So, all right, we've kind of talked about some of this, but what are some use cases for, for events and event-driven architecture? Um, so use cases would be microservices like for us, data streams. So we also use data streams, like we use Athena um, for feeding a lot of different data lakes and stuff like that that we can and then start use QuickSight on and then we can get some BI and stuff like that. Um, feeding data into third parties, that was another one, is we, uh, we integrate with Salesforce, we integrate with our ERP, a WMS, that's a lot of what Seth works on. Um, and so we, uh, we integrate with a bunch of the third parties and we just throw it into a queue and all these other, so this is another thing with kind of going back is like Salesforce, we don't want everybody to hit Salesforce's APIs. So what we do is we put Salesforce behind a queue and we just tell everybody, hey, just throw your messages in this queue and we'll, we'll catch it all. You don't have to worry about anything except for throwing it into a queue. And so that way it, it abstracts that level of complexity and they just have to hit a queue. Um, and then if you need a replayability or fail safes. So if you have a single point of failure, like we were, um, we went through an investment round and it was one of the things I was in our technical audits and that was one of the things they dinged us on pretty hard is that we had a bunch of single points of failure and they were like, you have to move off. So, uh, uh, and my fallback is anytime you have processes that you don't need a response on, you know, if you don't need a response, why run it synchronously, you know, throw it into a queue and let it run outside of itself. Okay, so let's code. It. I don't know. It's already eight. So I've already talked for quite a while. We can code it. I don't know if we want to end right here. Um, we can kind of, I can quickly show something. I don't know. What? We can, we can go. And uh, once again, like I was telling him, it's live coding. Hopefully it works. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, let's see if I can hide this though, or at least move it. And for better or for worse, I'm a Vimmer. So I use, you know, so I hope everybody enjoys watching Terminal for a little bit. Okay, so I created a new Laravel project. I'll make this bigger too. Called Greyhound. 
um, like the bus. Uh, and I just instantiated it. I have it running on sale for anybody who knows Laravel. So I got sale running in Docker, got my Greyhound red there. And so uh, I've already done a couple of things just to make sure this works. And so I'm gonna kind of skip a, a couple steps. Um, if we want, we can go back and we can do some of this. I'm also gonna be leveraging a little bit of Laravel's eventing service because it's gonna help me also skip a couple steps, but we can go back and we can do that if people want that explained a little bit. But if basically Laravel has a command line where you can create an event and you can create a listener. Um, these are pretty big. Uh, it's just a command line. They have arson commands that allow you to create. I created an event called page hit and I created a, a listener called hurry and notify somebody um, as two things. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna hit the page and then we're gonna see if hurry and notify someone works. Now, I haven't coded those yet exactly. I've done some of it uh, just cause I didn't know how much time we have. So um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you what page hit looks like. So here's a basic, and this has a lot in it. Most of this is not needed. I could probably get rid of all of this to be honest. Uh, Cause this is just Laravel. This is Laravel. One thing notorious for all this worked on Laravel, they bloat everything. They're, they like that. They like putting in extra. Really nothing here. We could rewrite this whole thing and only really need the construct which is just saying within PHP, uh, we're gonna instantiate this class. When this class happens, pass in a message. That's it. We just need a string message. Um, and so we're making this super simple. You can make this more, more crazy, but we just have a class that when it gets instantiated, it's gonna have a message. What you do is you uh, then create, for example, send, oh, hurry and notify someone is, this is the listener. And I'll show you how these two connect, but the listener basically just has a handle function in it. Now I've created a package and this is, this would be up on packages, except for my packages got overwritten by my companies and now it's consumed by my company and I'm trying to separate them. I was hoping to have it up before this, this conversation, but I do have a, a package where you can easily connect up to SNS um, by just calling these three commands and it will, all you'll need is your topic and we'll set up a topic right now too. But it's something we use within Fashion File to connect with our topics. And I'll even show you the code. It's pretty simple. But within our listener, what it will do is I'll show you in our event service provider, the listener will listen to that event. When that event happens, you'll see that the page hit event gets passed into our handle function. And then we're going to be taking down on line 32, the message from the event and send it up to SNS. Okay. So we've talked about event, talked about listener. I know that some of this is already built with Laravel just for ease. Does anybody have questions or things that we can talk about here. Okay. So one thing to know is within the event service provider, um, this is something that is just a provider that comes with Laravel's framework. Um, and it's kind of bootstrapped in that when uh, one of these runs, you can define your uh, events. So we're having two layers of events. We're having in eventception a little bit where we're using Laravel events to then throw to a decoupled uh, SNS event. So I've defined saying that my page hit event, when that hits, you can define a bunch of listeners. So the hurry notify someone is a listener to the page hit. This is beneficial because you can set multiple listeners. So let's say I have a listener that when the page gets hit, update Google Analytics, even though Google Analytics would do it themselves, but let's just say, or like, let's say you're working with, working with some data lake or something like that, and you want to add additional listeners. I'm not here to talk about Laravel events, so we can talk about that another time. So here I have this event, external client, external event clients. All it does is uh, I have the SNS client AWS package installed. Um, it sets my AWS key and my AWS secret. Obviously I'm not gonna show those. It sets my region. And then it takes the topic from whoever's calling it and the message and passes it through. And then it publishes it up. So it's a very simple package but kind of wraps everything up for you. You just need to install sort of packages. So um, first we need a topic. I have one here that I did earlier, but I'm gonna actually make one. So once you go into AWS, um, go into the dashboard, you'll see, you can look up at the top. Who here uses AWS? Anybody or Azure, anybody? Obviously, cool. So we'll show you how to set up an easy queue. Um, we're gonna use simple notification service. Uh, which is just 
passes through notifications. You would usually pair this with simple queuing service to get some queuing capabilities, but we can just use the notification service right now. What we're gonna do is we're gonna go to topics. We're gonna create a topic. You can create whatever one you want. So we were talking about first in, first out. Let me make this bigger. Uh, first in, first out method is what we're gonna use. And so you can kind of define, you could do a standard one, which would make it through um, a little more asynchronously. We're gonna call this um, tests, let's see, Lehigh meetup page. You can give it a display name, I won't right now. Um, and we'll just skip through, we could do some logging. I'm not gonna do any of that right now. Um, I usually do set tags. I think it's a good thing to do. Um, so, you know, you, I, I usually put in something like uh, environment. Sorry, what'd you say? Oh, delete me. Oh, that's a good one. I'll do an environment staging because um, I will, I'll create topics. Sorry, what'd you say? Oh yeah, Envi environment. Nope, that's not it. Environment, there we go. And then we'll add delete me. But I'll usually create top, I'll create queues for staging and production. So that way I can do my testing. Um, so then I'll create the topic. This will then give me just a basic topic. And the only thing I really care about is this ARN number or this ARN. Uh, and so what I'll do is I'll take this IRN, I'll paste it into here. And I put a little tag. So within my package, I have a little tag of it'll explain what, what the event that was being triggered was. So within Laravel, I created, I'll go here first. I created a route called slash events. The slash events hits the event controller, the index method in it. So we'll go to the event controller. And within the event controller, I am calling, I'm triggering, I'm dispatching the page hit event. And we get to send a message. So right now I have an empty string. We'll say, hey, Lehigh meetup. This worked. And we'll see if it works. And then it's just going to turn back page hit successfully. So all we're doing is we're just hitting the event. And we're saying, so this could have been like user was registered in the controller or wherever in your code you're dispatching the user registered event. And then there's listeners on the back that are gonna be activating and doing something with it. So if I go into here and I hit it, we might get an error. We did, that's great. It's exactly what I wanted for message group ID parameter is required. Oh, okay, I might not be able to use this one cause it's, let me do a standard one. I think the first in first out one is it, that, that end. Oh, it's cause I was using standard. I'm only built for standard. I use the first in, okay, let's go back and we're going to recreate this. Uh, Lehigh meetup, take two. That's what these tests are for. All right, we'll add a delete me into here too. Okay. Awesome, that looks better. Okay, so let's go back into uh, hurry and notify someone. Go in here and we'll delete and we'll bring this back. And now we'll try and hit it again. This page is it successfully. Cool. So this can sometimes take a minute to proc. Does anybody have any questions while we wait for this? Oh, I actually forgot something really big. This is not going to do anything. It's not going to do anything right now. Why? Because nothing's listening to the queue. So um, one thing I'm going to add really quick is under services. You need something to listen to it. Anybody here use Lambda functions? So there's serverless functions. I created one earlier today. Uh, very, very simple. I just Googled console log the message. So that's all this is, just node console log. So all I want is I'm gonna attach a listener to the end. When that SNS queue gets hit, this is gonna be triggered, the Lambda function. The Lambda function is just gonna tell me what it's getting. And so this will be a good way where we commonly will take a Lambda function, which is for those who haven't used it, just a simple function, right? I really like Lambdas because they're very solid. They're single or, you know, principle oriented where you can only really do one thing with them if you're using them correctly. If you make them too big, then you can, but just usually not the best way. So what I can do is I can add within here, I already have a trigger I was testing earlier, but 
to do is you want to add your so just like we we're doing Laravel, where an event triggers a listener, we're not doing an SNS and in AWS one also. So I'm going to take this Lehigh Meetup two, and I'm going to have it start listening to SNS. So let me hit this again, and then hopefully we'll see it get. Hit. All right. Any questions though? Well, well, this this usually takes like a minute or two before it actually shows up in it. In. Okay. So uh, for those who use this, uh, CloudWatch is pretty awesome. Um, CloudWatch is AWS's service for monitoring. Okay, so it hasn't hit yet, or it won't hit. We'll find out. Um, but what will happen is it'll show usually show on here that something's hit the queue and hit this lambda and it was triggered. And then what we can do is we can go into the CloudWatch and we can actually check the logs and see the message. And hopefully if it worked out well, we can see our message. And then from there, we could go back into our Lambda function and we could redo all of our code to act however we want with on that message. So let's say the message would have been that user registered. And now I can see within this Lambda, I'm getting the user registered. I could then take that user and place it into Salesforce or place it into my ERP or my WMS or wherever. And I could create multiple Lambda functions and they could each do that at the same time, like in parallel, which is actually what we do right now. So that's one of our main reasons for using this. So we'll see if it actually oh, didn't hit. I'll try and hit it again, make sure. Um, if not, I'll show the example from earlier. But that's basically what I had. Um, hopefully it shows up, but if not, um, that's, you know, most of the event driven design that we work with. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I perfect timing. I was really excited to do this again. Nice. There it goes. So now we have it. So it even shows you how many times it's been hit. So the only the first one's hit. Um, there's been one. It was successful. It gives me some, how long it took to run, which seems oh it's 5.74 milliseconds. I thought it was seconds for seconds. I was like holy cow. That, what is my lambda function? Wow. So now what I can do is I can actually go into my logs. And it should, um, let's go into view logs in CloudWatch, so it'll probably be easier. I should be able to go in here and see. So you can see all the different ones. So this one's from today. We'll see if I can find my log of me hitting this. So it's loading all the events that have been hit. Man, struggling. That data. Oh, it didn't actually give it to me. Interesting. Oh, there we go. Okay. So looks like we have a couple. Are we on 819? Yeah, we are. Let's look at these ones. Let's see, it triggers a bunch of them. So here we go. Hey, Lee, I meet up. This worked. So what I could do now is I could take that message and I could pass that message on to whoever I wanted to. And so that's how I got it from my Laravel event up through SNS to a Lambda function. And then I could just, I could create 50 Lambda functions that each do their own thing and each take five milliseconds to run. And they each do very specific things. I could update my database with this comment if I wanted it to. So um, I hope this wasn't, I know this is a lot. Um, so I don't know how confusing it is. And I also talk very fast sometimes, but it's a fun subject and if anybody has questions i'm not the i'm obviously i don't have all the answers but hopefully we'll experience not all of that but some of it and we can have hang on better answers so thank you everybody nice thank you Dana. yeah well, let's see Oh, good. The okay, I guess I should have realized, checked if they, were, if they could hear me. It's my bad. That was that was at the beginning of the meeting when we were okay. seeing ourselves. Cool. They couldn't hear people. So. Awesome. Yeah. We don't have the, the Jeff Wright's license anymore. We're using them. Let's see, thank you to the platform SH that did it. This one is the. I'll head over to JCWs after we wrap up any more questions. Thanks again for presenting. It's really good. We also want to thank Entrada for giving us a place to meet and some food. Yeah, thank you. No, no, I think.
Well, we're still playing. Yeah. <laughs> 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 we did it three times.